Here's a fun place to talk about, Dave and Buster's. Anytime I go there, or to any arcade really, I go straight to that basketball game where you're just shooting the ball into the hoop over and over. It's strangely addicting, so I play that until my arms start getting sore, and then I'll make my way over to the coin pushers or whatever else. But then, for the last few years, they've had this game Connect Four Hoops, which honestly combines two of my favorite things. So clearly, I find this place entertaining, and based on how successful they've been, I'm guessing many of you feel the same way. They have more than doubled in size over the past decade, to about 140 locations in 40 different states, so as long as you're in the US, you probably don't have to go too far to get to one. In 2016, they surpassed a billion dollars in sales and continued growing from there. You could see that 2020 was a bad year for them for obvious reasons. They had to close for a while because of the pandemic, their sales and profits went way down, their financial statements were looking pretty scary to investors. I don't want to go too deep into that because it's fairly straightforward. They were strong enough to weather through it and seemed to be well on their way to recovery. For this video, I want to look at the big picture and talk about how something that started as nothing more than a daring concept it grew into this nationally successful chain. It is a complicated subject with a lot of parts to it, but I've done my best to try to simplify it into five reasons that I believe to be the most impactful toward their growth and success. The first one of those being the concept. I described it as daring because back when they started, and I guess even today, I don't think there's anything quite like it. Alright, my best attempt to describe it would be if you mix an arcade with a sports bar and a steakhouse. Let me know if you agree with that. I know it sounds like an unnatural Frankenstein combination, but it's been working. They describe their segments as eat, drink, play, and watch. Going through them, for eat, they have a full menu of higher-end choice-grade steaks, burgers, various appetizers. They change up their menu twice a year to keep things fresh, and they recently reduced their menu items so that they're able to better prepare the ones that remain on there. For drink, they have a full-service bar. I'm talking about beers, cocktails, cocktails, spirits, but the key segment that really separates them from the others is play. They have an arcade area that they call Midway. It's on average filled with 150 games, some of which you can't find anywhere else. And of course, they get you hooked because you win tickets at most of those games that can be redeemed for different prizes, and some of those prizes are pretty decent, but you have to win an absurd number of tickets. Those are the three segments that make all of their money. The majority of it does come from the games, but the watch segment earns money indirectly by adding to the environment. It's their newest segment. In 2010, they started this big initiative where they spent millions of dollars to put dozens of televisions all over the place. They use the term D&B Sports because they play primarily sports games intended to promote a communal viewing experience. They even have this wow wall that has like a 40 foot wide LED TV on it. It may be a little excessive, but they've been aggressively trying to become the only place to watch the games and play the games. I do recognize that these are all things that you will see some version of somewhere else. Else, but the fact that Dave & Buster's has effectively combined all of them together is what makes them unique. My second reason goes along closely with the first one, but I think it's important enough to emphasize separately, and that's the fact that adults have always been their main focus. Higher-end food, more expensive, fancier games, the fact that they serve alcohol, almost everything about them is meant for adults. They've been a popular place to hold private parties or business events. Kids have generally been allowed inside of Dave & Buster's, but they've never done much to try to appear to kids. They've always been much more concerned with people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And considering that most of their money is made through arcade games, it's almost counterintuitive, right? But the fact that they are different is what's helped them avoid all of that competition. Basically, if you were to take a Chuck E. Cheese's and start changing things one by one to make it better for an adult, you would probably end up with something very similar to Dave & Buster's. My third reason behind their success is that I don't think you could find two more perfect people to start a company like this. The founders of Dave & Buster's were indeed Dave Corivu and Buster Corley. Not only were these real people, they complemented each other perfectly. Dave was in the business of games and entertainment. He had previously been a blackjack dealer, he had started his entertainment-based restaurant called Cash McCool's, a great name, and by 1977 had opened his new similar place in an Arkansas train station called Slick Willie's World of Entertainment, another great name. Coincidentally, 
apparently that was the same year as the first Chuck E. Cheese's, so there was clearly a market for that kind of place emerging. On the other end, Buster knew all about the restaurant business. He started out as a waiter for TGI Fridays, worked his way all the way up to general manager, and in 1978, quit his job there in favor of starting his own restaurant. He invested about $50,000 to open this tavern type place he simply called Buster's that was located nearby in the same train station as Slick Willie's. They would actually be fighting for the same customers. People go back and forth between the two establishments, so at that point, the idea of combining just made sense. So the plan there was to combine Dave's entertainment talents and Buster's restaurant talents into one business and to do it in a big way. They raised money by selling Slick Willie's and finding private investors in the Little Rock area that trusted them based on their reputation. In total, they raised about $3 million, took it to the much bigger market of Dallas, Texas, and opened the first ever Dave & Buster's in an old warehouse. It was such an equal partnership that I guess they flipped a coin to decide whose name went first. Obviously, Dave won that coin flip, and as you would expect, he was the one put in charge of entertainment, buying higher-end pool tables and arcade games, while Buster was in charge of the food, deciding to serve higher-end steaks and burgers. That first restaurant that they opened in 1982 already had many of the same qualities that we know them for today, and not surprisingly, the public instantly responded to it. The two of them continued operating it in their respective roles, and after six years, they opened a second Dave & Buster's in the same city of Dallas, Texas. It was right about then when things started to change, and that's leading me to my next reason, which is the funding. Dave & Buster's has had various methods over the years in finding the money that they needed to grow, so this is going to be the perfect opportunity for me to talk about the impact from all of the different owners of Dave & Buster's over the years. Here we go. As I said, in 1982, it was founded with the primary owners being Dave and Buster themselves. But in 1989, when they had those two locations in Dallas, they didn't have the money that they needed to open more of them. So the way that they were able to make it happen was to sell 80% of their business to a much larger company called Edison Brothers. Now, Edison Brothers had started in the 1920s as a shoe store and had since grown and evolved into all different areas of retail. They owned all of these clothing stores, home improvement stores, sporting goods stores. By 1989, they were the owner of over 2,500 retail locations operating under so many different names. Meaning it was actually kind of a small acquisition for them to buy those two Dave & Buster's locations and use them to start an entertainment segment that they quickly complemented by acquiring a couple of other chains of entertainment centers. The money that Edison Brothers put into Dave & Buster's is what allowed them to grow. Over the next few years, they opened new ones in Houston, Atlanta, and Philadelphia, each one bigger than the last. The strategy there was to enter highly populated markets with really big locations. It was working well on the sales end, but the issue for Edison Brothers is how much of an investment it took to open each one. It was something like $10 million each, and they were going through their own separate issues with declining sales at many of their retail stores. So in 1995, they got rid of Dave & Buster's by spinning it off into its own company. That company was put on the stock market and owned by the public. Dave and Buster, the people, were named co-CEOs and shared responsibilities in leading the company from that point. Just looking at their sales, they continued growing, mainly because they were opening new locations. They even made a licensing deal that resulted in Dave & Buster's branded arcades opening up in the United Kingdom. And then things did slow down quite a bit going into the 2000s, possibly due to an oversaturation of the market by that point. Their response to that was to cut costs where they could, especially by laying off some of their employees and by slowing their growth plans. The next ownership change happened in 2006, when they were bought by Wellspring Capital Management, a private equity firm, in a $375 million deal. This right here was significant because Buster left the company almost immediately following the purchase, and Dave left the company the following year, meaning for the first time ever, it was being managed without them. To address the potential oversaturation problems in the bigger cities, they started opening new Dave & Busters in less populated areas in much smaller buildings. So if the Dave & Busters near you isn't all that big, it was almost certainly opened after 2006. Not much else to say here. The next owners were another private equity firm. In 2010, they were bought by Oak Hill Capital Partners for $570 million. And then, to finish off the list, they were put back on the stock market, meaning they were sold back to the public in 2014, and that's where they remain today. So looking at this list here, we can see that Dave & Buster's has gotten a new owner every few years, and it's impacted how they operated their business and where they got their funding. Alright, back to my original list. I'm gonna say that the final reason behind their success has to do with their marketing and promotions. A common problem for this type of business is the fact that sales
sales tend to be far higher when they first open a location compared to a year or two later. It's the kind of place where it's the new and exciting thing in an area, so everyone wants to check it out when it's new, but then it's a struggle to get them to come back. It has been an ongoing problem for them, and one of the biggest ways that they fight it is through their marketing and promotions. They're spending tens of millions of dollars on their marketing every year, mainly on national commercials that will hopefully keep the brand in everyone's head well beyond their grand openings. And then there's promotions all over the place. They have these sweepstakes type contests, uh, their famous all-you-can-eat wings, a half-price gameplay where all the games are half-price on Wednesday. All of it is effective in getting people to return to Dave & Buster's, and once they get there, they're forced to deal with the power card. If you're not familiar with it, you spend real money to put chips on it that are then accepted at the games, but holy cow, is it confusing. You go to buy these chips, and the packages are spaced out in all these weird increments, and then you have the option to supercharge that adds more chips to your original option at a discount. The point is, by the time you're swiping that card to pay 8 chips to play Connect 4 Hoops, you have no idea how much money you actually spent to play that game. And since you're so detached from your real money at that point, you're going to be much less hesitant to spend it. Let me know in the comments, what is your go-to game when you go to Dave & Buster's, and how do you feel about them in general? I know, it's like one of those places where you can easily spend way too much money, but it is a fun time, and I think it's a great story as well. Two people coming together, complementing each other's talents to create something that's gone through all of these changes, gone through some ups and downs, even some scary parts, but overall has done really well. So any thoughts you have about Dave & Buster's, the people, the place, the games, the food, any of it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.